We've talked a lot about Hollywood. We've talked a lot about spies. We've talked about cults. But we haven't talked a lot about occult spies. Today we're going to talk about some of the cases that you may not be familiar with where the world of intelligence overlaps with the world of cults. Mind control, rituals, brainwashing. Author Adam Mandelbaum in his book, The Psychic Battlefield, A History of the Military and Cult Complex, writes, is not only the fact that secret societies are practiced in keeping secrets, but that their members are un- are <clears throat> not unfamiliar with coded words and symbols and handshakes that make them useful for military and intelligence purposes. Many members of the triads, the Masons, and other secret organizations have access to economic, social, and political intelligence sources that are of tremendous value for espionage purposes. Possibly this was of great value for military and strategic tactical purposes throughout all of history. I think that is definitely the case. If we go back to the ancient world, uh, the spy world would especially be composed of people who were, for example, errand men or postmen, the mailman for the king or for the emperor. If we think about the time of Machiavelli in his book, Art of War, he talks about the military leader might need to use any kind of religious symbolism or uh, anything that would uh, sort of endear his troops to him, including superstition or even staged miracles, something like this, to garner the support and the uh, the spirit of his troops, so to speak. The Hashashin, the assassins uh, in Islam who would use drugs, use uh, very powerful opiates to give the impression that if you had given service to, uh, you know, to your cult leader in that regard as an assassin that you could go directly into paradise and the drug trip would be filled with uh, buxomy, beautiful women and so forth, all of which was engineered as part of a religious engineering to create the hashashim using hashish. If we think about uh, Madame Blavatsky, who we covered the other day in our Guru live stream, old, <laughs> old Mama Blavat, uh, she uh, she was rumored to have been a British spy. Uh, don't know if that's if that's for certain, but it's definitely possible. And if you go over to Espionage History Archive, there's a, a great a- a essay over there about the Tsar utilizing um, spies who would dress up as Buddhist monks and take trips to Tibet. Uh, during the period of the Great Game when it was first starting. Now, the Soviets and the Bolsheviks uh, made quite a use of religious engineering. For example, figures like Gleb Boki, uh, figures like Nicholas Rorick were uh, not only spies and, and working with Soviet Bolshevik intelligence, they were also very much into the occult, channeling the Ascended Masters. And according to Dr. Richard Spence, uh, writer of the, the famous book, uh, secret agent 666 about Crowley who is also a British intelligence asset for MI5 Dr. Spence argues that in fact Madame Blavatsky and these other great white brotherhood people that their uh, ascended masters were actually probably just other revolutionary counter espionage handlers so people like Giuseppe Mazzini and others were probably the real ascended masters who were speaking and giving these uh, coded revolutionary uh, messages right if we think, uh, we go back to even the time of uh, Queen Elizabeth, John Dee, the famous ma- uh, magician and magus, right, who was all into Renaissance magic and this kind of stuff, who created this Enochian magic language. Turns out John Dee was actually the first 007. He would actually sign his coded messages with the zero, zero, and a seven, and that was a two balls and a cane. You can guess what two balls and a cane stand for. And that would later be, you know, something prominent in masonry but john d was of course uh, queen elizabeth's spy she had a vast spy network and there's paintings that you'll see of her where she's donned in a bunch of dang eyes looking pretty creepy and those eyes represented her vast spy network and she would also utilize religious engineering or the church of england as part of that spy network as well if we think, as we said about uh, Aleister Crowley, he was, as I said, an, an agent provocateur at the time of World War One. He was also at times in, engaged in missions for MI5 for uh, at the behest of Maxwell Knight, who was also an espionage 
handler for British intelligence. Um, he was also an occultist, an avid fan of Crowley. He's the basis, in part at least, for James Bond's uh, handler, M. M is actually based in part on Maxwell Knight. And of course, Ian Fleming wrote all that into his novels. Um, I don't know that Ian Fleming himself necessarily had any interest in the occult. Uh, he did put quite a few occult images in some of the, the Bond novels dealing with alchemy and so forth. But definitely uh, uh, Maxwell Knight would be another famous British intelligence person who did have an avid interest in the occult, as well as Dennis Wheatley, who wrote the uh, Devil's Ride Rides Out with Christopher Lee. Right? If you've read Devil's Ride, Devil Rides Out or if you've seen the movie with Christopher Lee, then you know about the British intelligence, uh, intelligence fascination with uh, Crowleyanism and the occult, which uh, figures prominently with the character of Wheatley. L. Ron Hubbard, as we know, was part of naval intelligence. To some degree, it's debated exactly to, to what degree he was really involved in that, but he went through the ranks of Crowley's uh, DIY cult thing, where when you graduate, you basically go on to create your own cult, and of course we get Scientology out of that. So uh, the roots of that are the ethos and sphere of Crowley as well. <clears throat> Um, Jack Parsons, who was another one of the devotees of the Crowleyan sphere, who had this falling out with L. Ron Hubbard and so forth. Uh, Jack Parsons of uh, JPL Laboratories famously also sold secrets to other countries. So there you get another espionage uh, and occult angle with the, the figure of Parsons. If we think about um, Colonel Michael Aquino, Michael Aquino was... Anton LaVey's right-hand man for a good while in the Church of Satan. And then, of course, Michael Aquino went on to create his own uh, satanic religion, the, the Temple of Set. And he, went, he, and he also would become an uh, important figure in defining the, mod, the Army's modern doctrine of information warfare or mind war, psi war. Uh, so you have another clear connection with uh, Lieutenant Colonel Michael Aquino. Uh, and... That doesn't exclude Anton Levy either, at least it's, it's, it's reported, I, don't, I haven't verified this, but a lot of authors do contend that uh, Anton LaVey himself was an informant or to some degree worked with Interpol uh, to do uh, espionage work for some amount of time. If we think about, again, you can go back uh, in, in, into history and come up with more important figures. In espionage, you have a relationship in some degree with occults or the occult, or with with cults, or the occult, uh, skull and bones. Or skull and bones itself has this very uh, pseudo Masonic sort of structure. It's Lodge three two two, and skull and bones um, is really the origin of the American intelligence apparatus. I mean, the, the the first generations of the the OSS and the CIA are typically people recruited uh, from um, skull and bones. Uh, people recruited out of secret societies in the Eastern Seaboard elite universities, Harvard, Yale, and so forth. Uh, if we think about um, other bizarre examples, there's there's stories that when Churchill came to power and he set up his own sort of spy network uh, when, when he was running things, uh, that he, being an avid uh, fan of Druid thought and uh, theology, that he combined some of this with his approach to spycraft. Uh, if you get deep into to Churchill, there's also... Um, the Cambridge Apostles, the X, the X Club, uh, some of those people were also interested in uh, the darker side of the occult, and they would factor huge in the uh, Cambridge scandal of the Cambridge Five, right? The, the Soviet spies, uh, who it was always questioned as to who the fifth man was for a long time. So, as you can see, there there is a pretty avid, vibrant history of a connection between espionage uh, and and um, the occult. And another angle we could look at with this is Freemasonry itself. I mean, I tend to look at it as more of a, a phenomenon that worked to be the British Empire's spy network. It helped to build the empire. And in fact, mainline historians like uh, Jessica Harlan Jacobs have written uh, books like Builders of Empire, where she argues that this was uh, largely the, the, the British Empire's sort of spy network. And if you watch movies like uh, The Man Who Would Be King with Ma O'Kine and Sean Connery, you'll see that uh, that's pretty much what, what they're up to, right? They're just doing these kind of like, uh, they're sort of con men, but they're also kind of spies too. And they, they had 
done this these adventures and exploits when it came to um, to military uh, uh, intelligence and whatnot, and then they become uh, con men, right? Trying to create their own religion and control uh, a tribe. But uh, it's a great example of, of this overlap that not many people know about. And we've seen that as well with the CIA. The CIA has been involved in, in varying capacities, according to many researchers, in different cults and occultic groups. Jonestown wasn't really occultic, but it did have a very cultic vibe uh, and a very dark philosophy, obviously. And um, when, when we think about other cults as well, we can see sometimes these uh, intelligence networks kind of being in the background or at least having some degree of interest or connection to these groups. Um, for example, going all the way back to the Hellfire Club, uh, for Sir Francis Dashwood and ben Benjamin Franklin uh, were engaged in quite a few orgies and, and quite a few uh, wild lascivious parties. Uh, and they were also, at least in, the, in Franklin's case, I think Franklin was pretty much a spy too. So you can see a connection there between the occult and the spy craft that uh, Franklin was engaged in. But uh, there's a, a quite a bit more to this and, and that I'm going to talk about. If you want to watch, we're going to do a full lecture on this. This will be available for subscribers. If you want to, you, uh, go over to my website, Jay's Analysis, or to Rockfin, to my channel there. And we're going to do a full lecture going deep into this. We're going to go deep into the Cambridge Five. We're going to go deep into uh, many other cases, some of the documents the SRI remote viewing. We're going to go deep into the uh, uh, connections between the U.S. Uh, military and the black arts uh, studies that the military has done on black magic, on psyops and psy war using superstition, voodoo, and so forth. We'll look at that in the many instances and cases of that and uh, stuff that's a little more mm, not appropriate, we should say, for YouTube. So head on over to my channel for that that will be our next kind of in-depth lecture that we do and i want to remind you that the show sponsor is chalk.com the greatest supplements out there by far head on over to chalk.com that's chok.com and use the promo code j50 to get 50 percent off literally the best supplements out there i mean the, the tomcat ali has proven in peer-reviewed studies to give you uh, a, a full-on straight-up testosterone boost i've been taking it for months uh, you can definitely see that I've lost weight uh, over the last uh, couple of years, in fact, but especially in the last uh, six to eight months, uh, we've trimmed up quite a bit over here uh, on, on my side of things. I recommend the daily just for overall supplementation. Uh, if you want to add to your daily regimen, uh, if you already have a good diet, then you probably need to at least at, at least consider supplementation because the foods that we have, are, you know, our soils, they're very nutrient depleted. And so the best way to make up for that, for the nutrient lack that we have, is through supplementation. Chalk is an awesome company. All of their products are 100% rainforest source, 100% organic. They have the, the, the strictest process out there when it comes to quality products being uh, uh, the, just basically cold-pressed adaptogens is what we're talking about here. Um, they have a really high-quality ashwagandha. Shilajit, great for mental clarity. Jamie takes the Shilajit every day. It helps balance hormones as well for her. Um, there's also Action 2.0 if you're looking for that extra boost when you're going to the gym or getting ready for your uh, daily exercise regimen, whatever it is. Head on over to chalk.com, chok.com. They also have excellent superfoods like the chocolate, which I highly recommend if you're looking for um, something to add to your, your daily smoothie regimen. Definitely get some chocolate. I mean, it literally tastes like chocolate, but hardly any of the sugar, hardly any of the the downside of, of you know hot chocolate or whatever uh, jamie drinks chocolate every day as well she's a big fan of it and also if you want to not have to do the recurring thing where you go and put everything in uh, every month you put your information in to have to reorder chalk offers now the recurring subscriptions where you use the promo code j53life j53life and that makes it a lot easier uh, on you to where you don't have to go and put all that information back in again so head on over to chalk.com if you want to test it out, get one of the stacks for men or there's a stack for women, use that promo code J50 to get 50% off. Or if you want to go ahead and use J53LIFE and get 53% off on that recurring subscription that you need now. Now, and I say now because we don't know uh, how long that's going to be there. They're trying to push legislation to basically get rid of 
the ability of people like me, Tristan and others to sell supplements online. So they're our great, great, great sponsor. We love those guys so much. And if you want to support me, then you want to support them as well.